of the two co-sponsoring organizations for this event, the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning and the Collegeville Institute. I am pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. As all of us know, today's world is a multicultural and multi-religious world. And this multi-religious context demands that we use different approaches in theological discourse. One such approach, comparative theology, has emerged as a field that focuses on ways in which learning from non-Christian religions can enrich Christian theology. Today's lecture presents how the study of an Islamic concept of sainthood may inform Christians in answering one question that emerges from the multi-faith context in which we live. That one question being, is it possible for Christians to acknowledge individuals of, tradition, of other traditions as saints? And I'll repeat that. Is it possible for Christians to acknowledge individuals of other traditions as saints? To help us unpack this provocative query is our speaker, Hans Harmakaputra. And a few words of introduction about Hans. Hans is a PhD candidate in the theology department at Boston College. He received his MA in Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations from Hartford Seminary and his BA in Theology from Jakarta Theological Seminary. He has authored numerous articles and a chapter in the book, Violence, Religion, Peacemaking. His dissertation work is supported in part by the Collegeville Institute, where he is a resident scholar and a Bishop Thomas Hoyt, Jr. Fellow. And Hans is in residence at the Collegeville Institute with his wife, Rita. Wave, Rita. <laughs> and both will be on campus through the end of this academic year. So please join me in welcoming Hans Harmakaputra to the podium. Thank you very much for having me here for the lecture. It's an honor and a pleasure to have uh, all of you present today. So uh, as you can see, the title of my presentation has something to do with sainthood. And to begin with, I want to make a little disclaimer that I'm a Protestant. <laughs> so, uh, but still I'm dealing with Catholic materials Catholic figures, but also I put here and there my Protestant pr perspective to the, uh, to the lecture. And this is part of my dissertation, as you may guess. So I'm very happy to hear your thought, your comment, criticism, whatever. Uh, I'll be very happy and uh, to receive it. Okay, so I got this picture from Google, from the internet. Uh, it seems that this picture has been into many uh, websites, uh, especially during All Saints Day. Uh, the artist uh, pictured it, uh, numerous, a multitude number of saints in this picture. And this picture repre uh, represents my question. The, the, deepest question that I try to answer in my uh, dissertation uh, project and also in this lecture. Namely, is it possible for Christians to acknowledge individuals of other traditions as, as saints? Is it plausible? Is it okay theologically, primarily uh, as a theologian, that's my angle. And obviously my answer is affirmation, yes. Right, but uh, going to that affirmative answer, I go through different authors, different uh, figures, and one of the initial uh, research point that I encounter is this book uh, by Albertus Bagus Laksana. So he is a Jesuit from Indonesia uh, who graduated from the same program. Uh, like me uh, in 2012, and he is now uh, teaching in Indonesia in Sanata Dharma University. And this book 
is a field research on six uh, shrines, let's say. So three shrines for Catholic saints and three shrines of Muslim saints in Indonesia, in Java Island. It's the one of the five biggest island in Indonesia. For you who never heard of Indonesia, it's a huge country, a lot of islands, uh, uh, 17,000 mostly uninhabited, but uh, uh, it's a very diverse country. It's the biggest Muslim population in the world. From 250 million, there are 87% of Muslims, about 8% of Catholic and uh, Protestant, so they, they differentiate between Catholic and Protestant as uh, each own religion. And other uh, Buddhist, Hindus, uh, native religions and others, indigenous religions. And what's interesting from, this, uh, re from his research is that in the shrines, both uh, Muslim shrines, Muslim saints shrines, uh, and, and Catholic shrines, there are people of different religious tradition praying. So phenomenologically, uh, he found Muslims praying in um, Mary shrine, Marian shrine in Java, and also Catholics who pray in Muslim saint shrines. And obviously the reason or the motivation are different for, for each person, but uh, many people feel about uh, peacefulness or inner, inner peace. So when the Catholics go to Muslim shrines place to pray, they find peacefulness and they remain Catholic. They find God even though it's a non-Muslim shrines. And the same with the Muslims. They go to uh, Catholic shrines. So these are the, the starting point that makes me think about the question, is it possible? And it's possible. Practically, people are doing this. It's just often uh, scholars might categorize this uh, phenomenon uh, or phenomena as popular religion, perhaps, instead of saying this is legitimate theologically. But uh, apart from that, I also encounter uh, two other figures that fits the cross-veneration things. One is uh, Father Franz van der Luth, a Dutch Jesuit priest who, who served for a long time in Syria, and he was killed uh, in 2014. And afterward, both Muslim and Christians in, in, the, in, in the city, or even in the country, commemorate him in different ways. One is through visiting the, the tomb, who is located in a Jesuit residence in Homs, uh, and also in theatrical uh, play. I will explain more at the end, uh, so I will skip uh, this, and I'll go, I'll go back later at the end of the lecture. And the second person is a famous Muslim figure from Indonesia, and also a former president. His name is Abdurrahman Wahid, but he is popularly known as Gusdur. So similarly, he is a figure uh, that is crossing the borders. So many non-Muslims, uh, Christians, or even Confucius, Confucianism, no, what you call it, Confucians, uh, it, it confused me. Uh, Confucians uh, regard him as a saintly figure. And as you can see here, these are uh, students from universities, what you call it? It's like a Indonesian Christian Students Association across colleges, but they are Protestants. Uh, so that's why they don't pray uh, near the tomb. While uh, on the bottom, uh, you'll see some Christians because they are Papua, and most of the Papuans uh, from Eastern Indonesia are either Christians or Catholics, and they pray next to the tomb without any uh, reservation. Because for Indonesian Protestants, uh, it's a bit difficult to pray for dead people. It's one of our uh, contention with the Catholics. Can we pray for dead people or not? So that's the thing in Indonesia. But again, I will return to this uh, figure later. So from 
the initial findings, I found first, phenomenologically speaking, cross-veneration of saintly figures exists in the world, especially in, the, in places where uh, religion, religious communities live side by side, like in Syria, Indonesia, and I believe in other places. I know in India as well. Um, and then saintly figures might be a bridge for enhancing uh, interfaith relations, particularly Muslim-Christian relation. And then if Christians can acknowledge individuals of other faith traditions as saints, what are the theological rationales from a Christian perspective? So as a theologian, I'm interested not only on sociological uh, and anthropological findings, but also to formulate a Christian understanding of this phenomena. How could I, as a Christian theologian, uh, take this phenomena of uh, Muslim Christian saints or saints or how could Christians recognize non-Christian saints? And during the early proposal writing, uh, one of my readers, uh, Sean Copeland, uh, who is teaching at Boston College, said to me that Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, provides one of the foundations from what I'm looking for, because in this document, it mentions how holiness is not only, uh, or holiness can be found outside the church. So it's not monopolized by the church, it's not. And that the church is not the sole possessor of truth. And for instance, it mentions, uh, although many elements of sanctification of, and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. So there is this uh, recognition of sanctity outside the church, the Catholic church. And also in the in other paragraph, and there belong to or are related to it in various ways. The Catholic faithful, all who believe in Christ and indeed the whole of mankind, for all men are called by the grace of God to salvation. So there is this notion of finding holiness outside the truth, even though it's still something related. And somehow it, the holiness is not just different holiness, it's the same holiness, so it's related to the church, to the Christ. And as a good uh, starting point, the document does not really elaborate more, and I think that's the task of people, theologians, and others to formulate uh, other parts. So in order to elaborate the, the theological rationale, I use comparative theology method uh, in my dissertation because I want to graduate from my program, just like Chris Conway here. <laughs> and uh, for you who, who, who have not heard about comparative theology, this is one of the uh, famous definition by Francis Clooney. So comparative theology marks acts of faith, seeking understanding, which are rooted in a particular faith tradition, but which from that foundation venture into learning from one or more other faith traditions. So first, comparative theology is an act of faith, as the word theology implies. Next, it demonstrates the openness to learn from, not only about. Uh, and the willingness to rearticulate one's own faith in the light of the learning from the other faith traditions. So uh, to make it easier, basically comparative theologians are people who are willing to learn deep about other religious tradition. And after the learning, when they return to their Christian uh, position or looking at Christian doctrines, ethics, they see those uh, aspects in a different light hopefully better ones. So that's comparative theology method. And in this uh, project, I compared the notion of sainthood and saints from a Christian perspective with Islam, especially as formulated by Ibn Arabi, a famous mystic, medieval mystics from uh, Andalusia. And since I don't have enough time to really go into the detail with theological exploration uh, on Islamic concept of sainthood. Here I just give you several uh, important points from uh, Islamic, for Islamic concept of sainthood. So first, um, 
saints is called uh, friends of God in Arabic. Awliya Allah. And in singular, uh, wali Allah. So in Arabic, the root word for wali, friend, or an awliya, the plural of wali, is this consonant of uh, W-L-I, L-Y, which connotes proximity. So it's, it means to be near, to be close. And al-wali is one of uh, God's beautiful names in, uh, in Islam, in the Quran. And the root word generates two further meanings, to be a friend and to direct, to govern, to take in charge. And that might be related to the fact that similar to Catholic perspective of saints, um, saints in Islam also perceived by people as a powerful figure. So if you go to Muslim majority countries, you will easily find uh, saints of, uh, sorry, shrines of saints, except Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you'll see how people will go on daily basis to, do, to go there, pray, and, and expecting blessings through the saints from God. So one of the textual foundation is from Quran uh, chapter 10 or uh, verse 62 that states, Verily the friends of God have no fear or sorrow. And then another textual foundation from Hadith. Hadith is a collection of Prophet Muhammad saying, says, when they are seen, God is remembered. And I really like this uh, Hadith. Uh, and somehow Paul Tillich, Thomas Merton, uh, express the same thing. A saint is uh, someone who, whom when they are see, uh, seen by people, God is remembered. So. And then another Hadith Qudsi, another form of uh, Hadith, mentions the importance of saints as someone envied, even by prophets and martyrs. And in Islam, prophets are like very highly regarded figure. Uh, in Christianity, everyone's our prophet, uh, as long as they are uh, voicing justice and God's will on the earth. But in Islam, prophets uh, connotes different uh, category of people, special peoples. And Prophet Muhammad is the last of the prophets. But this hadith mentioned that even prophets and saints envy saints because of their closeness, their proximity with God. And according to Ibn Arabi, walaya, so this is the, the term for sainthood or friendship, denotes God's self-disclosure to creatures that is universal in nature. So it's something universal. And as a universal sphere that encompasses all human beings, one's religious identity does not restrict the manifestation of walaya. Okay, so I'll go to... Uh, canonization of saints and its problems. So now going back to Christian part. Uh, my main interlocutor for this part is Lawrence Cunningham, who is uh, teaching for a long time in Notre Dame. And for him, there are three problems of canonization of saints. The first one is the total clericalization of the calendar of the saints. So most of the people on the calendar of saints are clerics somehow, or related to religious life, not lay people. Uh, the second one is the lingering of old prejudices that might contradict and become irrelevant to Christian values in today's world. For example, sexual stereotyping, including anti-sexual attitude and prioritizing celibacy over marriage. Um, and then the third one is the exclusion of people whom the Catholic Church considers as non-orthodox or heretical, or just people who has a history of disputing with the, uh, or having ecclesiological problems. And that includes Protestants, for instance, uh, and also non-Christians. And for Cunningham, these are some reasons behind the decline in the practice of venerating, venerating saints in the Western context. Because if you read like Robert Orsi, he, he, he has done a lot of research on Catholics in America from uh, mid of 20th century. Uh, but I think from that time, it's getting uh, common for younger generation to not really venerating uh, saints. 
And for Cunningham, that's one, that's, those, are, those three are the reasons. So saints, as miracle workers or heavenly patrons, made them into figures whom Christians needed to venerate but not imitate. And for him, it's more important to imitate the saints rather than just venerating them. And then uh, one alternative that he gives for, for this uh, issue is by changing or al alternating the canonization, uh, what he called Fox Populi, or voice of the people. So this uh, is an inductive method in approaching saints. So the primary way to recognize saints by the community and this was before the canonization was established, before 10th century CE. Uh, started by local communities, recognized a person or people as saints, and they just started local cult. Uh, and then local bishops were involved at that time and had the power to vote, but people were primarily responsible. And between 10th and 13th century, the power to name a saint was transferred to the church. So that's how canonization process become more intricate and uh, lasting in, until now. So by restoring the method of Fox Populi, by giving more chance, more uh, responsibility to people, Cunningham believes there will be more room for non-Catholic figures to be recognized as saints. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Mahatma Gandhi, and others. And for me, this method can be a uh, meeting point between Catholic and Protestant as well, because Protestant will, and has always been doing this, even though not all people, they, they will label saints. Uh, and actually, I, uh, I found something about Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany, but I don't have time for this. And then there are uh, several paradigms in approaching saints, according to Elizabeth Johnson, uh, companionship paradigm and patron petitioner, the, and of course, she prefers companionship in her book. Uh, and companionship paradigm reflects the earliest mode of relationship as uh, testified by the New Testament. So this started in the early church community and it placed all people, both the living and the dead, in a circle of friends linked by God's grace. So the saints are not situated between people and God but are with God and living disciples. And uh, later, after fifth century, uh, the patron petitioner paradigm become dominant, especially in the medieval time, where the saints are perceived primarily as intermediary because people felt they live far from the majestic God, so they need intermediary before Christ. Uh, and their role shifted into patronizing those who send prayers and devotions. And for Johnson, there are issues with patron petitioner. And one of the, the issues are how come contemporary people now have a different attitude toward death. Uh, contemporary people no longer speak to the death or feel the presence of the death. And, and that really changed the paradigm. And for her, it's better to return back to the companionship paradigm. Uh, a colleague, a friend of mine at the Collegeville Institute, Katie Snyder, who, who has left, uh, read my chapter on this, and for her, this paradigm can be combined, actually. You can see a saint as a pattern, but also it really moves that person to emulate the saint. And I think that could be agreeable. So the community of Friends of God believe that the saints are not only the departed ones. So when we talk about saints, we are talking not only about uh, saints who are in the heaven, but also those who are living. And these and all of those saints are uh, constitute the community of God's friend. And then holiness stems from the consecration of one's being by God's grace. And and then manifest in ethical and pious practices. Remembering encourages emulation of faith in creative ways by taking care of the world. And the memory of the martyrs and saints also boosts 
uh, people's hope amid the adversities. So the pain and suffering experienced by people today will not have the last word because of God's redemptive and liberating power. And does it include non-Christian people? And for Elizabeth Johnson, she states, yes, uh, because all Christ, uh, it includes all Christians as well as persons of goodwill. And within human cultures everywhere, Spirit Sophia calls every human being to fidelity and love, awakening knowledge of the truth and aspiring and inspiring deeds of compassion and justice. The friends of God and prophets are found in every nation and tongue, culture and region, and even among religions, culture despisers. So that's uh, Elizabeth Johnson's uh, position. And this is just an example of one theological rationale that I pr uh, provide in my project. Another important figure is Karl Rahner with his notion of universal uh, grace in all human, uh, but I don't have time. And but I will use one of his uh, concept here, intercommunicative mediations of God's grace. So Cunningham defines a saying as a person so grasped by a religious vision that it becomes central to his or her life in a way that radically changes the person and leads other to glimpse the value of that vision. And using this definition, saints can exist in non-Christian religious traditions. And also, this redefines the notion of saints as intermediary. So intermediary does not always have to be that saints, and then we ask for something, and then uh, the saints intermediary intermediate our request to God and to Christ. It doesn't have to be that way. But saints can be uh, people who communicate or become mediation of God's grace in many ways. And they become refillers of new modes of holiness. As an example, Mother Teresa, very famous, I believe everyone knows. The second one uh, is Teresa uh, of Lisieux, who is not very well known as Teresa of Calcutta, especially for Protestants uh, like me. <laughs> but uh, Teresa of Calcutta really admire her, uh, the, the, the other Teresa. And, and for her, she is the source of inspiration. So this is how uh, saints can mediate new mode of holiness. Something that does not exist in the past now exists for today and needed for today's context. More uh, example is Martin Luther King Jr., who derives his uh, not only strategy, political strategy, but also spiritual uh, thoughts from Gandhi. And as you know, Gandhi was inspired by Jesus Christ, but uh, through Leo Tolstoy, right? So it's a different kind of a uh, Christian. Uh, but this is just to show how there is this web of holiness from one person inspiring others, inspiring all of us to practice something different in our own context, that the new modes of holiness uh, enable saints, us, to practice different things in new uh, circumstances. All right, now uh, in the remaining of five minutes, hopefully I can uh, elaborate Father Franz. Uh, I have a video of him that I want to show, just less than one minute. Het is voor mij heel belangrijk dat ik niet wanhopig word, maar hoopvol blijf. En dat kan ik ook voor anderen wat betekenen voor iedereen. Als ik dit huis verlaat, dan blijft er niks meer over van dit huis. Uh, dat is voor mij een belangrijk punt. Een ander belangrijk punt is dat hier nog steeds christenen zijn. Er zijn nog, nu nog denk ik 28 christenen. En die wil ik niet in de steek laten. Als alle christenen weggaan, blijf ik hier toch. Want ik ben hier voor Syrië. Ik ben hier voor alle Syriërs. Ik sta in dienst van alle Syriërs. En van Syrië, het land waarvan ik houd. So, Father Franz, uh, he spent 
more than 40 years in Syria. Living among and serving people indiscriminately of their religion. And after living for years in Aleppo and Damascus, in his 60s, Father Franz moved to Homs, where he established the All Art Institute, means the Earth, on a 50-acre land. The institute facilitated children with special needs to work on the farm and vineyard. And of course, uh, people of different faiths gather there. Uh, no, uh, it's not really matter whether you are Christians or, or Muslims or Druze or others. And besides farming, he used to organize annual hiking for young Syrians at the Jebel Ansaria. And the group consisted of Muslim, Christian, Druze, and Alawites. When the, when the Syrian civil war broke out in 2011, the city became a battleground due to the existence of anti-government forces. Although he had several chances to leave the city, he chose to accompany people who opted to stay. And as you see in the video, there were uh, like 28 Christians, and before that it was 60,000 Christians in the city. So uh, the city has become very messy because of the war and he preferred to stay there. And due to the siege by the government forces, people were famished. Father Franz tried to share the little food he had with other people and supported them mentally by listening and caring as mental illness began to spread. And later, uh, an, an, an unidentified person uh, br broke into the uh, the resident uh, and he was killed. He was shot by that person. And none of the groups claim responsibility. Both the anti-government and the government forces claim no responsibility. And uh, during his funeral, even the uh, anti-government leader came to give respect. So his death was mysterious, but his, his work for, the, for Syrian people really uh, left the mark. So for keeping the memory of him, uh, the first pilgrimage to his tomb done by Muslim Christians. Uh, the second one is through theatrical play. Uh, this one is a play by uh, Nawar Bulbul, a Syrian play uh, actor and, and director, the, uh, played by Syrian refugees, uh, young people from two places, one in Amman, Jordan, and one in Homs. So they use Skype to do this uh, uh, play. It's about Romeo and Juliet. And in one scene where uh, Juliet should kneel to a friar, uh, the name of the friar is no longer the, uh, the name in the original script, but become Father Franz. So that's how Father Franz uh, played in that play. And not only that, this, the, the script also reflects Father Franz's uh, vision for peace. So at the end, instead of killing or doing double suicide between you know, Romeo and Juliet, it was Juliet who said, uh, enough for, for death, we want to live. So that really reflects Father Franz's uh, vision for Syria. And then the third uh, way of keeping memory is uh, he becomes inspiration for others who continue to work inter for interreligious relation and service. For example, Jesuit uh, Refugee Center in Lebanon named their place Franz van der Lut Center. And in the center, every Tuesday, for instance, uh, they have this uh, cooking together uh, event. Uh, and then also other, other people who, who want to continue his work in Syria. As for Gusdur, uh, he was a prominent Muslim figure and former president of Indonesia. Many Indonesian Muslims uh, consider him a saint. So if you remember the first uh, picture I showed, Muslims, thousands of Muslims will visit his place uh, on, daily, on daily basis. And uh, he was a leader of the biggest Muslim organization in Indonesia that consists 30, 40 million member. Uh, according to the current leader, it's like 80 million member, but none of them have a identification card. So. We really don't know. It's more like a cultural organization. So people can claim that they are a member of that, even me. Uh, so he was well, well known for his preference toward the poor and marginalized, even during Suharto's regime from 1966 to 1998. So Suharto was this uh, authoritarian figure who ruled Indonesia for 32 years. And 
uh, Gus Dur roles uh, in democratize, democratizing Indonesia went parallel with the dissemination of more tolerant and peaceful Islam. And he built an amicable relationship with and consistently protect minority groups such as Christians, Chinese Indonesians, and etc. Concerning the Chinese Indonesians, he revoked the government's policy from Suharto's time that limit the public expression of Chinese cultures in 2011, such as Chinese New Year celebration and recognized Confucianism as one of Indonesia's official religions. And because I'm a Chinese religion, Chinese Indonesian, just like Janice, uh, this person becomes very uh, like dear to, to personally for me, uh, because even like my name is not a made up name, you know, many uh, people come to US and just to make it easy, just call me Hans or any, but this is something that I got from my parents. And my parents and my grandparents had to change their name from Chinese names into more Indonesian name. So that was uh, one of the policies that restrict Chinese uh, Indonesians during Suharto time. And Gustur uh, really revoke all this uh, discriminatory regulation. So during his two years of presidency, he was impeached. Uh, he, done, he has done a lot of things and he always become a peacemaker for, for Indonesian society. So to end, uh, the, some ways to keeping memory, one pilgrimage, the same. Second is the Pesantren, that's a, in a Islamic traditional boarding school uh, where he lived and where he was buried becomes a site for disseminating harmony and peace. So this picture is a picture when 160 high school students from Canisius, uh, uh, Canisius College in Jakarta came to the city, came to his uh, school and to, be, to learn about uh, interfaith relations. And then the third one is interreligious Haul. Haul is a Japanese language, but it's, the meaning is annual celebration of death and anniversary. Just like a Catholic saints also celebrated uh, at the time of death, not, not the birthday, right? So the Haul of Gusdur becomes very, uh, pretty much interreligious in nature. It will be, there will be a lot of cities, a lot of organizers, and they are all interfaith communities having the uh, celebration. And this one is in his uh, hometown and behind uh, the ulama, uh, these are Catholic uh, uh, kids basically playing violin and playing music in that celebration. And many churches have hosted the celebration as well in Indonesia. And the last one is Gus Durian community. It's like uh, interfaith uh, groups in many cities in Indonesia who tried to uh, continue Gusdur vision for peace. So to conclude, while Muslims and Christians respect and commemorate both Franz van der Lut and Gusdur, they might not regard both figures as saints properly, like uh, in Catholic sense. But uh, using the Fox Populi method, uh, it gives people power to name someone as a saint even without uh, official recognition from the church. So I will stop here and if you have a question later, we can discuss. Thank you. So Saudi Arabia is known for their uh, denomination, let's say, using Christian term, uh, Wahhabism. So Wahhabism is a 
an extreme from the perspective of traditional Muslims, uh, extreme view, uh, very textual and and against tradition. So for for them, the veneration of saints are something borrowed from from the Jews or Judaism and Christianity, and it's not good. It's not pure Islam. So for them, it's better to get rid of it. So when uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahab and Saud, uh, King Saud, who, 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 whose, whose name become the Saudi Arabia now, uh, won politically, they get rid of the tombs of saints, including the tombs of Prophet Muhammad. So nowadays, uh, no one knows where Prophet Muhammad is buried because the political leader at the time was afraid that people will fall into idolatry, which is very, very Protestant things <laughs> of reasoning. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the answer. Why? Yeah. Well, I, so I'm I'm very attracted by the term community of the friendly body because it sounds very expansive and inclusive. Um, I would look for if you, if you can give this now, that would be great. If not, I would want to have a, a lexical. Uh, definitions of these terms. So is Wali the same thing as Philios? And if, are they, what are the shades of difference that the Muslims mean by Wali, what Christians mean by yeah. Philios in the New Testament, and how close it also goes to the English word friends? I don't know. I think that would be very interesting. Um, do you have anything to say about that now, about Wali and Philios, for instance? Um, I don't think I can say anything right now, except I think uh, when I translate walaya as a, as a sainthood or even friends friendship, it's I cannot really convey the hundred percent from Islamic view, uh, just like translations, right? Um, but somehow it's very close to the term proximity, and of course proximity means proximity with God, so that they share power. God's power. So in that sense, it's very similar to traditional understanding of saint, uh, as someone who able to convey God's blessing uh, because they have proximity with God in heaven. Right? But in the Islamic sense, uh, it's more egalitarian. There is no canonization. Uh, people can regard other people as uh, wali. And and even there is this traditional notion in in, in Islam, la yarifu wali la wali, which is no no one knows about saint except saints. But people know, <laughs> so there is this uh, dynamic uh, or interplay between knowing a saint as a someone uh, as a friend of God and those who are not. That's in Islam. Um, so it's supposed to be secret, but people know. However. And and usually saints similar I think with saints in Christians and in Christian context they do not want to call themselves saints. Uh, there is this reluctance from the person to to call themselves saint in front of people. And one figure that uh, captivated me is Dorothy Day, because Dorothy Day is really hated being called saint because for her when you called me saint you just want to get you know you just want to leave it to the saints and not doing by yourself. So it's something like uh, not good to do for her. Uh, but in Islam, there is also this notion of secrecy uh, in saints. So God's friend, but, but the first, the Quranic verse uh, about God's friends, of course, for many Muslim uh, commentators, they are just like Muslims. So only the Sufis or those who believe in the Wali that, that will say the friends of God are special people. M most will say, just like Protestants do, I guess, uh, that this we are all communal of saints. We are all God's friends. I see this as a, as a tension in, what, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. The very first image you showed to us, you got off of Google, has just this multitude of people. And this, which is, I take it, your interpretation of the possibility of the community of friends mm -hmm. who are saints. But it seems to me that also, by the end, you're talking about this one man in Syria who stands above the 
many people who, who deserves our special recognition as somehow set apart. So that there does seem to be a tension between looking for an understanding of saints and sainthood that's inclusive and another one that recognizes the specialness. There's only one saint in this room. <laughs> We're not all saints. There's only one person who, who <coughs> according to Cunningham's definition, would show forth God in a visible way in his life. So I just point this out as a tension that I've seen. Yeah, the reason why I choose only one figure from Syria, one figure from Indonesia, is to show cross generations. As a Protestant, I firmly believe that all of us are saints, uh, but non, not all of us got uh, cross generations. So that the purpose of the two figures is like a case studies, I guess, uh, just to show that uh, Muslim and Christians are able to, to respect or recognize, to some extent, saintly figures. But uh, in my dissertation, I, I explained, I follow Elizabeth Johnson's uh, notion that everyone's are saints. It's just that some people uh, manage to convey their, themselves in a, a more explicit ways um, to, and then get recognized wider in wider context. But obviously, everyone has God's grace and must cultivate God's grace in a sense. So that's, that's why it's, the tension remains. Uh, Chris, just kind of following off that, in Pope Francis' recent uh, apostolic exhortation to adopted in Exaltate, Rejoice and Be Glad, he quotes Leon Bloy, who says, the only great tragedy in life is not to die a saint. Mm -hmm. And the, the theme of that is a universal call to holiness and encouragement uh, of all persons to pursue, pursue that path. Uh, I was really struck on your kind of lineage of, of sainthood. From, um, from King to Gandhi to Tolstoy, and at one of the symposia that Catherine Cornell hosted at DC, I think it was David Eppel who pushed that a little bit, that lineage a little bit further, and said that for Tolstoy, St. Jehoshaphat and Balram were mm -hmm. very influential to him, and St. Jehoshaphat was an Indian prince who uh, encountered suffering and then followed the way, right? And then through kind of a linguistic uh, recovery, it turns out that Jehoshaphat is in fact the Bodhisattva, right? <laughs> the Buddha. Uh, and it's, so it's kind of disappeared from certain saintly calendars, remain in other, in others. And so I think my, my question might be kind of tease out um, the, the relationship, maybe the, the theology of religions that, that is operative here, if there is one. Because um, I know Frank kind of steps back when it comes to theology. Franklin steps back when it comes to theology of religion. And that's it. Uh, is the saint holy as Muslim, as Hindu, or as anonymous Christian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use Rahner. So I use uh, his notion of anonymous Christians. But for me, uh, I read Rahner as a particularist, from particular particularist lens, not inclusivist, uh, which is very technical for <laughs> our people. But, but basically for me, people are holy as they, what they believe. So Gustur, I don't want to impose Christian perspective to Gustur. For him, for me, he is holy because of what he believes in Islam. And there is another case that I don't present here, a case of martyr. So in the year of 2000, when there were some tensions between Muslim Christians in Indonesia, there is this one young guy who protect the church. So it's a common for uh, Muslim youth to protect churches during Christmas Eve or Christmas uh, season. And this guy found a bomb in a church. This was during, uh, after Suharto's uh, removal of so many, many conflicts. So he found a bomb and he failed to, to, well, he tried to bring it outside, but then he, he kept it, so he, it was, uh, he was blown by it. So he gave his life to protect Christians. Uh, if you use theology of religions, of exclusivism, he is like nothing. Uh, no, nothing of him really matter for us Christians. And I don't think that's right. Even for, for me as a Protestant, uh, even though I won't call him a saint, his deeds is pretty much to be emulated. And that's rooted in his Muslim beliefs to protect uh, other people, to do his job properly. So I think that's something... Uh, that my position is. Um, 
uh, a person behind Crisp, and then. Yeah, um, at the, when you were finishing your answer to Don, the base back race, what does it mean to call us false saints? I mean, obviously, many of us don't live much of the time in saintly ways. Um, and so what, what do you mean when you say we are all saints? I, I understand that all of us are offered grace, we can all maybe be touched by grace, <coughs> if, not, if we're not cultivating grace, which is your word for it, for your grace, what do you mean to call everyone say? Yeah, uh, I use uh, the, the term cultivating grace from Rahner. So uh, I believe that everyone is infused by grace and the grace is God's okay. own being. So it's a God's gift. It's not something created, it's uncreated grace. So this is becoming more technical, uh, but by cultivating for Rahner is something uh, for people to respond positively to God's calling. And by, by it, it means that doing good works, uh, loving neighbors, and for Rahner, that can be happen even to atheists. Uh, so that becomes my perspective as well by cultivating. But are we only saintly when we do? Oh, no, no. It's a consecration of our being. Well, we can be consecrated and, and deny the consecration. Uh, John, do you want to respond? <laughs> Our question is very similar. Is there any developmental sense to what you're talking right. about in terms of sanctification? <coughs> in other words, the way I would think of it is mutuality with God. But if there's mutuality with God, it means there's something constituent by the person who's being mutual with God and who's being mutual with each other. Right. So this, where's the developmental sense in this? Yeah, there is. Is there one? Okay, so I understand it. Yeah. I think there is definitely a developmental uh, uh, way, but it begins with God's grace that that requires, or not requires, but that enables us to do good works. And that's something because of grace. So it's the consecration of our being one for, once and for all. It's not something uh, consecrated just like a Eucharist, for example. It's something that uh, in the very being, the capacity to do good, um, and this is something universal for all human. And of course, uh, there is this notion of saints and sinner, right? Uh, human is not always doing good. As you mentioned, it's about development and not everyone in the same development. But I believe that all people are sane, no matter how they, on what level they cultivate it. In uh, chapter seven, I'm dealing with uh, Jean-Luc Marion, uh, notion of uh, saints. So it's about access of God's holiness that everyone receive, but not everyone receive it in the same level. Um, so that's that's my take for now. I know it might be not making any sense, but uh, yeah, that's that's something I have to more clarifying um, to be more precise. I think like how to cultivate. Or an action of God, and there's an action of the individual. No, there is a notion of choice of the individual uh, person as well, because that person, the individual for Rahner can also uh, choose to not cultivating the, the grace, to ignore God's calling. So it's still uh, also the action of the individual. Yes. Ron, why don't you jump in? Yeah, I'm wondering about, uh, I, I, I know all the story uh, of a, a case as a priest in Sudan who is so deeply respected by Muslims and Christians that they go to him and pil make a pilgrimage to him as a living person so that he can pray over them uh, to, 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 for, for God's blessing. Right? And they might bring animals with them and they might, you know, so I'm wondering about uh, living saints and, and that kind of, I don't know if that's a holy holy man or what the word would be, but it, but uh, I'm sure after he's dead, he'll probably be a shrine, but, but he's living and you go to him now for, for this. So do you, do you talk about that? Or what do you think of that? 
yeah i don't really talk about that in my dissertation but but my my own take is that it's it's very possible when when gusdur was alive uh, many people already uh like perceived him as a living saint so even before his death uh i remember i i met him very briefly in uh i was having this workshop with muslims so i'm the only christian with a group of 20 young muslims talking uh, and doing more about politics and peace building uh and then we encounter gusdur who was uh in a radio uh like a well, he gave a talk and then there is this radio covering for him. And then all my Muslim friends are going to him and just to shake his hand because that's a way to get baraka, right? Uh, of course, I, as a naive Protestant, I didn't do that, but I took picture of him. I think that's, that's how I get the baraka indirectly. But yeah, the, the, the notion of living sin is very real and both Muslim figures, Christian figures can, can, uh, can attain that level. Although that's also the issue with those who criticize uh, saints, because the boundary between idolatry and and admiration or veneration becomes fake or not very clear. We'll take one last comment or question if there is one. I don't know. Okay. Oh. You, get, you get the last one. Uh, does it matter what the motivation? for um, valuing a saint or a person. For instance, Gustav, uh, well, in the, you, you talked about uh, Muslims venerating Mary and then Christians being at the, at the, uh, <coughs> at the wayside of Gustav. It seems to me that there would be, a, there could be a religious motivation for Muslims to venerate Mary because of the relationship between the Quran and the Bible. Right. I'm wondering if the motivation for Christians to value, let's just use a neutral term, Gusdur is more political than religious. And here's a, here's a wonderful example of a great man, in this case, who exemplified peacefulness. And, mm -hmm. But it's fundamentally political, not religious. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's a different perspective, I would say. Because for Indonesians, uh, or if I can make generalization for Eastern people, we don't really differentiate this is political, this is religious. So the domain with it, between religious, politics, economics, they are they are mixed and it's 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 so messy it's hard to differentiate so when people see gustur uh, they don't only see a political figure um, and that's very obvious even after uh, shortly after his his death that was during december at the end of december so during christmas season and some of protestant churches pray for him even though protestants really hate praying for dead people <laughs> but but the, it's it's a matter of theological uh, uh, wording. So we don't pray to Gustur or for Gustur, but we thanking God for giving us this wonderful person, human being, Gustur. And that's what that's what they do for the annual death celebration. I called my friend who is a pastor now studying at BU, and he is pastor from a city that is uh, the same region with Gustur. So he is involved with many interfaith uh, activities there. And I asked, so what kind of prayer do you do you give uh, and, and he said that yeah that's so it's about him it's it's not praying for him or or to him but it's about him and how he could inspire christians to do the same so i think in that regard it's not only motivation for political i think uh, but also something religious uh, how could christians contribute to the advancement of kingdom of god in the indonesian context and and Janice and my wife can confirm this, but Indonesian Christians are very non-political. <laughs> they are very religious. For them, it's separation of church and state is real. All right, thank you very much.